I'm Clark Green with the Elite Angler Academy, and this is part two of my Sam Rayburn MLF Pro Tour uh, recap. You know, the first part of it, we talked about kind of what happened in the event. In this video, I'm going to talk about bait, patterns, techniques, and everything else. Not just necessarily what I was doing, but the things I saw in practice for, uh, and understood from my years of uh, experience on Sam Rayburn. Uh, you know, I fell under some misfortune for the event. You can see that on video number one. Um, but I'm going to talk about right now what I actually did and what I saw in practice. You know, so <clears throat> I came into this event with a lot of experience, did a lot of prep work, sank a lot of brush and things getting ready for it, you know, to basically figure out how many patterns I could come up with. And again, I kind of talked about those, you know, earlier, uh, in some earlier videos where I did them in, during the practice period. Uh, but for this video, let's initially talk about what I did and then we'll talk about the patterns that I saw in practice and everything else that may help you at Sam Rayburn in the future. So I had a shortened day on day one due to some mechanical issues. And so what I opted to do is run up north, uh, which is typically, you know, now the 147 bridge is kind of considered mid lake at this point. It used to be considered anything north of that was north, but I pretty much ran north of the deer stand. Um, and I was going for an average, not trying to catch a random big bite, which is what you needed to do if you were fishing offshore deep and everything else. I was trying to just survive the rounds, and it, it, and it was still a numbers game. Whether you were fishing deep or shallow, the numbers game was, all right, I'm going to catch shallow fish, which is kind of unconventional un, uh, for me at Rayburn. People um, assume I'm going to fish deep every time, but I've got a lot of a lot of bullets in the gun, to, per se, but I ended up catching most of my fish flipping, chatterbaiting, and throwing a swim jig. Uh, the majority of my fish actually came on a black and blue Yamamoto Senko. Um, you know, the reason I chose the Senko over a jig or a beaver or something of that nature is the hookup and landing percentages seems to be better um, because I don't have to set the hook. A lot of people miss fish because they're trying to set the hook too hard. Um, so what I would do, I was rigging it Texas rigged with an eighth ounce weight and I was just basically pitching it at whatever pieces of wood I could find in the water. And because the water is three and a half feet low, um, you know, a lot of those fish would be directly on what little bit of cover was there. And so it became easy pickings. Uh, with it, the water again being low, it made it treacherous to run around, things weren't safe. You know, so I was actually catching unpressured fish because most of the offshore fish were going to be more in those community hole type areas uh, that were getting a ton of pressure. And so it was still a numbers game where how many fish could I get to bite and what are the odds that I'm going to catch more of those three to four pound fish that were going to build a bag to 18 to 20 pounds as opposed to being dependent on a six to, to eight pound fish to bite. Um, because I think in the grand scheme of thing for that event, there might have been like five fish over seven pounds caught the entire week uh, or in the tournament. So I knew those odds weren't good, so I was going to play the average with that Senko. And when I talk about hookup and landing percentages with that bait, you know, a lot of the fish would pick it up and go running with it. These weren't fish that were spawning yet or even thinking about spawning. Because again, the water temp was still cold. The bite was better in the afternoon because they were having to acclimate and warm up. Um, but it ended up being that when you would get a bite, a lot of times they'd run straight at you. You had to catch up with them. I was using a, a eight to one gear ratio reel um, just to catch up with these fish. Um, and because of that, how soft that Cinco was, I was able to just kind of reel and lean into the fish and then have to worry about just jacking one. Because whenever they start running at you, you tend to start losing a lot of fish. And you know, hookup and landing percentage is a major deal because if I lose the one big bite I get, or the two or three quality bites, you know, it's gonna leave me, you know, you know, in a bad position for the tournament. Now, in between, you know, catching fish on, on wood, I was throwing a jackhammer, and I was throwing a Yamamoto swimming Cinco on the back, you know, just for a different profile. I think they've been seeing the Zacco quite a bit, but this enabled me to adjust it to make it longer if I wanted to. And it has more of a kick than that actual Zacco, you know, so it has a whole different uh, look in the water. And I think a lot of people have gotten to where they're starting to throw the same trailer on there. Um, I was throwing black and blue. The water was more stained than it was down on the lower end of the main lake. And again, this was more in between, or if I just saw one isolated piece of something, I'd sling it over there. And I got one or two gift fish bites off that bait covering water. 
Now, the last bait that I ended up throwing was, it was an Epic Baits swim jig. And I think this one's new coming out on the market. And I was throwing it with a um, Strike King Rage Crawl on the back because it, f it swims real good. And again, the water's kind of staying where I was at. So I wanted it to have a lot more disturbance. And I didn't know, you know, you go into an area and there might be a little bit more stain than another or if a little bit of rain, the rain that we had on Monday was gonna dirty it up more. Um, but this one actually has a wire weed guard on it. And again, it's about hookup and landing percentages. It doesn't take much for that weed guard to get deployed. And it wasn't a lot of heavy cover that I was dealing with. Uh, and again, black and blue, because I was trying to make a silhouette um, in the water for them to target on, uh, and they could feel that vibration and see that silhouette of that black and blue. Uh, you can get most of those baits at Sportsman's Outfitters. I'll leave a link in the description below uh, if you want to uh, order any of those things. But, you know, again, that's really not what my main pattern was going to be, though, for this event. Uh, I had planned on fishing offshore. I did a lot of prep work. I built stuff in the water that I thought I could pull up to with the active target, and be able to basically make targets specifically for the active target. So if I had a fish that was pulling up in a drain, uh, that fish would be able to, I would be able to see that fish on the forward sonar and target that specific fish. And I had a lot of stuff in the water like that. I had a lot of standing timber, whether it be a big tree out in the middle of the lake that fish would suspend on, um, or it was stuff in these drain guts you know, and I'm sure if you've, you've paid attention to Rayburn or any of the, the other reports, you know, the fish use these guts to, to travel up on these flats, basically, you know, to spawn and everything else. But those fish really weren't there yet. You know, and it turns out, I think as the tournament went on and it warmed up as the week went on, a lot of those fish pulled up into places like that. But early on, they really weren't there, but it was still a numbers game. How many of these places could I hit uh, to be successful because again, all I needed was five good ones to weigh in. So it was how many of these places could I hit? But again, from having mechanical issues that took that out of play. Um, and so it was just one more thing off my list of potential patterns to run. Now the deep bite is kind of what I'm known for. Um, and it took me a little bit to figure out what was going on because again, I've got a lot of places that are like guide holes that I knew I could go bang out 11 to 13 pounds every day and I knew that'd be good for $10,000, but I knew I was still dependent on a random big bite. But after graphing some and checking a bunch of places, because again, in practice, I spent almost the entire time looking offshore for fish or looking for like a cluster of two or three fish or five fish, which may have been bigger females that were getting ready to stage and move up. But I noticed something, that even on these places that I catch thousands off of every year, those fish were so tight to the bottom that you wouldn't see them. And it, it took me a while, and, some, and I alluded to it in some of my pre-fishing videos, um, that they were doing what they were doing last year in November and December when I first started using the active target. And they were getting so tight to the bottom that if you didn't know that very acute spot, you wouldn't have a clue that those fish were there because they wouldn't graph up to be able to be seen. And so I would basically have to go over a spot and I'd see one fish like on the graph, but I know what those the potential is on those places. And then I'd get up on my trolling motor and again, I'd sit there with active target and I could see them crawling on the bottom. They look like little cro cockroaches down there, but because they weren't elevated very far, um, they wouldn't show up for somebody to just go graph. And so that was one of the, the detriments that people that came to this event uh, thought that, okay, I'm going to go graph because I know the offshore is going to be the deal. I go catch them on a Carolina rig or whatever else. But if you kept graphing around, it, you would realize I'm wasting a lot of time because you would not see those fish because they were so tight to the bottom. And again, so that was one more way that the local advantage was going to help me knowing that those fish were there, even though people that were just randomly graphing wouldn't be able to see them on side imaging or even on 2D or down imaging unless they knew that was a spot that they got. Now the tricky part is with it being the winter time, there was actually two different types of fish. Uh, there was actually three fish that you could catch for this event, it seemed like. You either had uh, pre-spawn fish that were staging, and that was gonna be more of the drain fish that were pulling up um, 
you know, on these flats and, and sitting on hard spots that were a little bit shallower, that was more in that 6 to 15, 6 to 18 range uh, that those fish were in. You had your winter fish, which were your shad feeders that were the offshore fish that guys thought they were graphing for, but because the water had stayed so warm for so long, the shad wasn't where they should have been in a lot of those drains for those fish to be suspending in them. Uh, and that they would have been able to see on the graph real well because a lot of the fish were still out on the main river channel suspended on the bait. And then it, you had, as a third option, uh, it was resident fish, whether it be those in the backs of creeks uh, that were kind of trapped back there with the low water, uh, those up the river off wood and things like that. And actually, I forgot about uh, a fourth one. You also had grass fish. And a lot of those were uh, going to be more your pre-spawn fish that were moving up but the detrimental design of that was they got so much pressure prior to our event being there in the January, whether it was the Rattle Trap Tournament, the BFL, high school events, whatever else, they just got pounded on so hard that most of those quality fish that were in the grass had already gone for a boat ride to the weigh-in down at Humphrey Pavilion or Castle Boykin. So they got displaced in the several weeks prior and without there being the right weather combinations prior to the event, uh, no new fish had really pulled up in the grass uh, of any magnitude to make that just an extremely viable pattern uh, for for you know people that committed to grass fishing on that lake. So, I'm Clark Ring with the Elite Angler Academy. That is my kind of uh, breakdown of patterns, the baits I used for the MLF Pro Tour at. Sam Rayburn, you know, I salvaged from having some mechanical issues to make a $5,000 check and to finish 71st, so it didn't hurt me in the points. But uh, that's what I saw during practice and uh, my take on what happened in the event.